Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the first alumni seminar um, today. Uh, so um, of the year, uh, my name is Elga Salvadore, and I'm replacing uh, Martin Siebel that couldn't be here today. So we have some changes, some some technical uh, tests uh, that we have been doing uh, this morning, and um, I would like to uh, introduce you briefly the speaker. So uh, this is uh, Professor Wim Bastiansen. He will give a presentation on Water Accounting Plus, Democratizing Data for Better Decision Making. He is the first professor on water accounting and is uh, doing his uh, uh, work here at UNESCO IG, but he's also a um, professor at TU Delft on remote sensing and is uh, also professor in uh, uh, Thailand at University Ka Ka Set Sats. Sorry, my apologies. University in Thailand, and is uh, um, but I don't want to take too much time away from this. So I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Wim Bastiansen. Uh, just a few technical things. Um, if you follow the previous seminars, you notice that you could send questions via Twitter. Well, this time uh, this um, option is not available. So if you have questions, you can send them. Uh, during this uh, during his presentation at alumni at unescoic.org and uh, we will collect the questions and select the best one and we will ask the questions to the uh, speaker so welcome professor Wim Bastiansen the floor is yours okay well thank you very much uh, Elga for uh, these nice words so um, yeah good uh, well good morning good afternoon we have people from sharing from all over the world and it's a great pleasure to tell you in this uh, next hour more on water accounting. Water accounting is rapidly gaining terrain. Uh, a lot of people realize that we need better systems to report on our water resources. And the purpose of water accounting is exactly that. So we have one hour. We go through some, uh, some slides on the background. And I will tell you also some, some examples uh, of studies that we are doing. Um, we will from time to time ask you also some questions so that we get a kind of um, active participation and uh, I would like to stop more or less after 40 minutes so that we have one block of central questions on all kind of things that come to your mind or you would like to have uh, clarifications on. So let's start with the presentation. Um, Yes, we all have the issue of uh, growing population uh, while the amount of land that is used for uh, agriculture remains the same. We get a situation that the area of land per person is going down. Eh? So if you look at the 1960s on this slide, you can see that per person we had about 0 0.45 hectare available to produce food, uh, but this has reduced below 0 0.25 uh, a few years ago. So we really have this immense challenge to produce much more food, but from a lower amount of land, which implies that the production per unit land has to increase. And this has a big impact on, on water resources. At the same time, we have competition. Uh, between uh, different water use sectors and also here on this graph we see the same trend that the per capita water availability is going down. Uh, so you can see that water availability in developing countries going down uh, but also in developed countries. Uh, so this problem is arising everywhere in, in the world. So yeah, we have to really start to think better on how, how we can use our water resources more efficiently. The reason I brought up this agriculture straight from the beginning is uh, the fact that we have a huge water footprint for our food. Uh, so um, you may think about your daily needs of water for households for your, to satisfy your domestic water demands. And this is about 15 liters per day. But what we do forget often is that on the same day, we use about 3,500 liters to satisfy all the water needs for our food production. So this is a huge amount of water. And sometimes I tell my students, like, are you eating bread or are you drinking bread? Because 
you, we really use a tremendous amount of water. And yeah, this is putting a, an, an, an extra dimension to the issue of a scarcity. So keep in mind that about 70% more uh, or 70 times more water is needed um, for food production than for drinking. And as a result, we get this competition and we get water stress. Now, um, the situation of water management is often solved at the river basin scale. Uh, we, we, we think in terms of management units of water. Uh, and the water divide is our main uh, boundary uh, between uh, different areas. And this boundary can be used to uh, divide the world into river basins. And, as you can see on this picture is that in certain basins in, in Africa uh, and also uh, in America and Asia, uh, we, we get um, to a critical level uh, that the water is getting scarcer. And this also happens in, in dry seasons. Huh? So very often uh, dry seasons uh, will be confronted with a shortage of water. And currently uh, we have now a new situation in Somalia and Yemen uh, where you really have to start thinking on every drop of water. So you would really like to know how your water is, is used and, and consumed. So um, it is often forgotten that environments also use a large amount of water. Right? So it's not only water for the domestic sector or for agriculture, but also environments. Huh? Very often on water allocation plans, this is a kind of missing. But it's a choice. If your government wants to have greener environments and also wants to satisfy, um, say, the, uh, a policy with, let's say, green lungs, uh, where we have a, a green growth, we have a good economy, but at the same time also a very fit ecology, now we have to put water aside to environment, uh, and not only for uh, for leaching. Uh, of, uh, of water, uh, but also to make sufficient water available for wetlands uh, and not treat uh, wetlands as um, the end users of the system. That in case water is left, you can send water to wetlands, but if the water is used, yeah, then wetlands can, can, can suffer. Uh, and also we have many uh, systems with, with groundwater interceptions. Uh, on this slide, you can see that you have all kinds of vegetation that also locally take a lot of groundwater. Huh? And technically, that is um, also a withdrawal of water. It's, it's the same as pumping this water out from aquifers. Huh? But often in, in, in planning of water, I mean, this is not uh, getting a proper place. So my plea here is if, if we look at water accounts, we should also include this water for environment. One other issue that we often uh, yeah, are very uh, uncareful about is the, uh, say, the aquifers. And so we have a lot of aquifers um, that uh, where we, we, we just pump water from, and not always there is a very good plan in place. You could um, plan um, water resources. And you, could, you could see how much water you could uh, abstract from a certain place. Uh, but it's, it, is, it is very important to, uh, to have a kind of a plan. And um, often uh, the situation is that yeah, uh, people uh, invest in, in own well so that they can flexibly operate this. And the availability of groundwater is very good for the user. He can switch on the pump when he or she likes that and you will have water immediately. But yeah, is, is, that, is that really a wise water management uh, is, is not so uh, often the case. Uh, many areas in the world, we, we, yeah, we have a fall of the, of the water table. Um, so in order to also get some feedback this one hour from the, uh, from the audience, uh, from all of you that are listening, um, we would like to raise questions from time to time and actually and this is a moment for uh, the first question. And the first question is, well, uh, why? Why do you overexploit groundwater? We see many areas in the world where the water tables are falling by one meter or sometimes five meters per year. And, 
it's not always clear why this is happening. So are there some people listening that can provide some answers to the fact why we use so much groundwater? So this is your time to uh, join in and participate. Uh, please uh, go to, I uh, hope you can read it, kahoot.it. And uh, in a moment, I will also share on the screen the question. Um, and then, or you can use, you can download the app for your phone, like you did uh, probably for the previous uh, seminars. Um, ready? So the question um, Wim was asking is, maybe, Okay. Um, is, uh, so please, um, you can use this number to join the questions. There will be four questions. So this is a five, eight, four, six, five, or four. I will repeat this number from time to time, but this will not change throughout the, uh, I hope you can see this. Um, so if you type this and I see already there are six players, so probably they played already before. Please mention your name and perhaps your country, country where you are from, so that we are able to use this as uh, some sort of statistics. Now we will wait still a moment to see how many, uh, if there will be a few more players, and then we will continue. I see now 13. Are yeah. you joined already? Good, join, please join. Please come in, use the code 58465504. Don't be shy, join us today and think about this question. Why in your country or the areas that you're working, you are over exploiting groundwater? We want to know what is the reason for that. At least your interpretation of this process. Shall we go? 19 so far, 20, okay. Um, I guess you can continue joining even though the, oh, then I'll wait a bit more, uh, even though the question is on. I think you can join in with the next uh, questions, the next four or five questions. Okay, let's start. You will have 30 seconds to answer the question and there will be four options. So why do we have over exploitation of groundwater? because we pump too much. Um, we cannot measure groundwater. Um, we have not uh, a management plan in place and groundwater is always be recharged. So basically there is no over exploitation. And can they give multiple answers or we only want the, the best answer? They can let's say more than one question could be right. I think into your system you can only answer one question, but we can have a discussion afterwards. But voilà. this is the outcome of the answer. So if we, if you want to comment about, yeah, I can see now um, that most of you think that we pump too much, and this is indeed, yeah, the main reason. And there is no restriction. Uh, very often there is complete freedom, uh, and electricity is uh, subsidized or diesel is subsidized, so pumping does not cost water in many countries, and it's so nice. If I was an irrigator and if I can just switch on my own pump and get the water on the field, yeah, that is an, an, an advantage um, for the, the farmer. But the problem is that we are ruining the aquifers, and so in the end, this is not really the way um, we should look at it. And um, uh, you know, the last, the last uh, say, 10 years have been dramatic in uh, terms of more and more over exploitation so um, I think sooner or later we really have to get this on the political agenda you know the policy makers should not get away with just leaving this this open-ended uh, so indeed the question number seven is uh, the most relevant okay so what we do now we go back to the presentation and uh, we take a few more slides uh, and then we will have a few uh, additional questions. 
So we have to switch some software here. Oh, okay, let's get and, that. Uh, yeah so yeah. so indeed huh? so the groundwater is the same now we have already as I mentioned several problems but unfortunately we make a wrong a lot of wrong decisions at the same time huh? and people are not always properly informed huh? or sometimes it's 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 an issue that you have learned maybe 20 years ago or maybe even your uh, university professor uh, and um, yeah, it still happens in that in many cases there is a lot of investment from international finance institutes, but often for the for the, for the wrong purpose. So, for instance, number one is that you know in our uh, practice we see a lot of groundwater pumping, but there is no cap, and so there is no exploitation plan. Or, um, as you can see, in many countries there is a conflict between the water demand for uh, hydropower versus the water demand for irrigation uh, and then actually all the dams are uh, releasing valuable water for instance in the winter season for uh, generating energy while the crops need the water in the summer season uh, so this is a big issue uh, or um, the, if the dams are full at the start of the uh, after rainy season uh, and then if you get a big flood yeah you have no capability to store that water also, in many documents that we see from uh, World Bank and other investment bank is that the uh, improvement of efficiency is mentioned as a kind of solution, like uh, the water crisis can be mitigated by improving efficiencies. And that is really not always the case. We have seen many examples and studies where they improved locally efficiency, but then they forgot to think about the downstream impact. So then in the end, people who usually were receiving the return flow uh, were suddenly not receiving that water any longer, uh, which is basically an, a flaw. Forestry is very good for many reasons, but we should also not forget that forests consume a lot of water. And so if you plant a lot of extra forests or you do reforestation, you should also uh, realize that you will get less stream flow. Uh, and, and one other aspect that I, I like to mention is that in the exploitation of water resources, we forget about a lot of natural withdrawals huh, that, that occur in by groundwater dependent ecosystems or shallow uh, water tables and so on. So we, we are in a situation that we need some more support. Uh, so if you ask experts, local experts on the situation, you often get different interpretations. One may say there is much more water available than somebody else and they think that they have the same basis, that they have the same understanding on how much water is available. But yeah, in reality and that is not always the case. So um, what we really believe and that is why UNESCO and its partners have started a water accounting procedure since three years ago is the need for an independent accounting system. Okay. Because if you have uh, provinces or countries sharing transboundary basins, um, the trust is always an issue. So if one gives data or if one country makes analysis of the river basin system, another country will start to doubt. So we believe that an independent system is very valuable so that you, you always have a second estimate uh, in your pocket that you can check how much water is in the system. So that is the water accounting. And we call our system the Water Accounting Plus. The reason is that the International Water Management Institute has developed water accounting already in the 90s uh, by a publication of David Molden. And basically we have been building up on that. So we made it Water Accounting Plus and now we report in terms of eight sheets. So the whole idea is that a policymaker can get sheets. It's very similar to financial accounting, where also you have a number of sheets. Uh, you have your profit and loss, uh, you, you, you have your uh, depreciation tables, you have your cash book, and so on. And this has helped uh, many financial institutions and, and, and companies and, 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 and governmental organizations function simply better from a financial point of view because there is a standard system that everybody understands. Now, 
the whole water accounting is the same idea but instead of dollars and rupees you know and and dongs we have now cubic meters of water so we report on how much water is in the basin how much water is consumed we call that uh, the water consumption sheet we look at water use in agriculture we have a special sheet for that we look at the amount of water in the surface water network like streams and lakes and rivers separately we have a sheet for um, groundwater uh, and also for ecosystem services because they are getting more and more important uh, we not only want to have a good economy and, and, uh, and, and, and a good uh, life quality situation high quality life but also uh, or one with very good um, ecological system and so we have thematic sheets that that help us to um, explain that so what we can derive from these sheets is something like is my water used beneficially or non-beneficially we make calculations for that and we we have developed standard procedures that that is the idea that we have a standard procedure based on standard input data and this input data can be verified they're all from taken from open access data sources i come back to that in a minute but i really would like people to check it that they go back to the origin of the data and to know um, where it's where it's where it's coming from and so we we think in terms of beneficial use is the water consumed or non-consumed uh, uh, consumed water means it's not longer available to downstream people is it utilized or still utilizable which means we can further uh, develop water resources is it green or blue water we make this distinction although we know not everyone likes the uh, the label of using colors but green water is water that is really coming from rainfall there are not many human interactions it just infiltrates into the soil and then it re evaporates by the vegetation uh, so that is really completely different process from water that is in lakes and in groundwater and so on and so i have here on this slide a number of typical things we discuss when we have to make water resources plans and longer term plans uh, like many countries make a water resources plan for the longer term and these kind of elements should be embedded in those plans now the point is that these kind of things we can read from the sheets and so in other words the water accounting sheets can be used to as an input into your national water resources plans but also on your longer term uh, river basin plan and, and it also touches base with things like water security and uh, and water scarcity okay so having said that then we like to come to the next question so question number two is like yeah how how does it contribute how can water accounting plus really contribute to make a better decision Elga, okay, so yes I'm can back. you get some actions okay. here and get people to respond yes yes well i'll try my best uh so first i'm moving a bit towards myself and then i can show you the uh, image and we, we can uh, move to the next question so like he said is how can water accounting contribute to make better decisions and here you have three options four options and 30 seconds um so again um multiple answers could be correct so there is not just one correct answer I see some answers are coming in six seven eight you still have eight seconds come on people don't be late press the great color show your opinion yes that's the answer 18 manage and I see a quite a mixed group yeah so the the first group says look we um, it is important that we have the, the same level of information to everybody and I think indeed that is very important and what you see in decision making is that the the persons uh, from the Ministry of Water Resources have a lot of information and then the people from the Ministry of Agriculture which they sometimes consider as the enemy you know they have a different information and it's 
amazing how they sit in the same boardroom and they have a completely different view. So absolutely, uh, this is an uh, important thing. But also the monitoring, and, uh, which is the second here, is very important because if you make a good plan, but if you are, do not have the ability to monitor and check it with your targets, it will be very difficult. And so um, a long-term plan means you have a target. You have a target on agricultural water, environment, sustainability, and you have to start monitoring it. Huh? So these are really um, the two major answers that, uh, that are valid. Yeah. So we can go back to our, question, so our uh, presentation. Yeah, we move on. Yes. Um, I hope it all works for you. So far, we are not getting signals that something is not getting through. So yeah. we assume it's all good. Yes. OK, so we move on. So um, yeah, what some people, they say that <laughs> You know, what is the difference with a classical water balance? Uh, we already make water balances for hundreds of years. And I always say, look, it is more. Right? We also work on a water balance. And from water accounting, you can create a balance. But what is nice is that we do this by land use class. And so a natural environment will always respond in a different way from rainfall than, for instance, an urban environment. Right? The, Fast runoff is very different, which has consequences for flood risk, but also the recharge of the aquifer is different, and the amount of water that's evaporated and basically is consumed is very much different. So if you want to make a good analysis on, yeah, what are my benefits of water? Yeah, you have to understand which kind of land use you have. And See, we have all kinds of services and benefits. So we, we would like to think a little bit broader. Uh, we also like to think about ecosystem services. Uh, um, you, the forests, although they use a lot of water, you know, they are also a main habitat uh, for, for many species. Um, they sequester carbon. Uh, um, but also uh, many irrigation systems can cool the climate. Uh, so in the vicinity of an irrigation system, the air temperature can really be a few degrees lower uh, than in, in a dryland agricultural ecosystem. Uh, so um, we have to think about this as well. So it's not only food uh, that we uh, have to think about and our own life and leisure, uh, uh, but also we have to think about environment. And I, I want to mention one more time that environment takes a lot of water. So, so it's more than a water balance. Huh? We, we look at every land use class, and this land use class is the basis to evaluate the, 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 the total package of benefits. So um, if we look at the river basin, we have all kind of options. Huh? We have different uh, land use classes. And uh, in water accounting, we basically follow these four categories, our main categor uh, categories. So protected land use is when you have a national park. Modified land use is, you know, when you have land use changes, and often this is rain fed cropping, but also growth of urban areas. Um, and that's where actually you change the land use. But if you change the land use, you change the infiltration, you change the soil moisture, you change the evaporation. You're not literally holding the water or so on, uh, but you affect the water balance. The class manage water use, you hold the water, you retain it, you divert it, you, um, you spray it, you utilize it, and so on. And the last category is more the natural cover. I say there are different options to intervene uh, in the water cycle and to make things more sustainable. Now, this sheet number one is an example of only one output. Okay. This shows you a bit the total picture of the basin. That's why we call it the resource base. It's a kind of summary, like how much water do we have? The upper green part is meant to, uh, to show how much uh, water is used in, in the landscape without human intervention. And the blue part below is on the exploitable water, and which part is still going to the sea and so on. I will not discuss them in detail. You can review it more quietly. 
uh, later on if you want to. And also we have a website, wateraccounting.org, that I will mention also one more time later on. But on the wateraccounting.org, you can really review these sheets in, in more detail. Important is that we distinguish between water that we withdraw from a source and the amount that we consume. That water is gone and the water is not consumed basically returns back and could be reused. So by distinguishing essential building blocks in the water cycle of withdrawal, consumptive use and return flow, we also can start to quantify the reuse of water efficiency, uh, which is the, 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 the fraction that can be consumed and the water productivity, because you know, we would like to have a maximum benefits from water that is consumed. Now, the problem is always the data. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we would like to have a global standard. Um, the aim is that in 2020, we'll, we will report about the water resources conditions in all the major river basins in the world. Uh, UN Water has asked for that. Uh, and basically, we need to work with global data sets. We, we cannot simply um, go to a single country and collect all the data or even start to install a new sensors in the field because that will really will take too much time. We have to start using data. Uh, um, we know that's not so easy. People always say, oh, we have everything. We have all the data. Uh, but if you go to a country X, you know, you need many cups of tea before finally you get this data. Uh, and then if you get this data, the quality is not always up to standard. So it is very important that, that we uh, unlock data. The way we do that is through remote sensing. So satellite data is a very important input into the water accounting because the image taken yesterday is available today. Uh, and we have many Earth observation satellites now. Everyone has a different mission and we collect all this data together. Remote sensing is a very good tool of measuring processes, but they measure the processes at the land surface. So if you would like to know what happens also in the underground, you have to um, integrate the remote sensing data, uh, say, um, with um, data that comes from hydrological models. Now, many countries have local hydrological models. Some models are very good. Some models maybe are a bit more inaccurate because the amount of data to calibrate them are not available. So to overcome that problem, we, we, um, we use a lot these global hydrological models. So we have now these models at 10 kilometer spatial resolution. Uh, and we use that, for instance, to um, determine process of recharge and groundwater movement and so on. Of course, ground measurements are always needed. We, we love ground measurements, you know, but it is also a fact that to have ground measurements in a standard way is, is not an easy task. So we use it when we work with local organizations, with local ministries, with local departments, with local research institutes as to the extent possible, uh, but they are really meant to, to support a whole case. And then the result of that is not only sheets and maps, because we have remote sensing data, so we can have also data on every 100 meter or 250 meter. But also we make tables. So for the uh, scientific advisors or policymakers, they can get tables with much more detailed output that the policymaker does not want to see. And everything is in Python. Python is the language, the computer language of the future. It's freeware and all the spatial data uh, analysis in the world are more and more based on Python. So I'm also Glad to mention that UNESCO IHG has now also started with the first courses in, in Python. This is the language of the future. Now, when you speak about remote sensing, I can imagine that you would like to know, yeah, well, what is it really? You know, what 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 can I really get? And on this slide, you can see um, an essential difference. Uh, on the left-hand column, you can see data that at this moment you can basically go to a website and download. The only thing is you have to know which websites. Huh? And this website, we, we did some quality checking. The middle column 
is much more meant for data that you have to derive indirectly, which means you have to collect the primary data first from websites, and then in the second column, you have to apply algorithms or interpretation yeah, models to get, for instance, to dry matter production or water withdrawals. And so it's not that you can get global water withdrawal data on a website. You have to kind of produce that. And within the water accounting team, we would like you to help with that. Which brings us to the third question. Uh, and um, and um, uh, okay. we, we, will, we will do that. Um, that is like, um, yeah, what is your opinion of this remote sensing data? And mainly on the accuracy. So the question is, what do you think about the accuracy of using remote sensing data? There are always people that say, look, I want to check it in the field with my own team, with my own devices. But they forget that remote sensing is also a device. Eh? It's, not, it's not a simulation or an estimation. It is a pure measurement. So what is the accuracy of remote sensing? Data? And in case you want to join, again, 5846504. We got 11 answers. Okay, let's go to 25. Come on. You have 11 more seconds. Uh, I cannot see the camera. So. Oh, yeah. uh, so. Okay, but this is time. Um. Okay, so in blue it says it depends on the database. Uh, some of them, they are positive. They say it's very accurate. Some one person is pessimistic. He may have he or she may have a poor experience, um, but indeed, and I, I think the blue isn't the, the right answer because we have so much, so many different databases. Huh? Um, some of the databases are really good. They are uh, created by high quality staff members um, in, in 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 certain specialized laboratories uh, and. For instance, an, an, a model or a database like CHIRPS Rainfall, and there is a huge group of people behind it. They have been um, applying it for many years, and these kind of databases can really be good. Uh, and digital elevation model can also be very good, but not everyone is having the same accuracy. Of course, um, and that's why uh, we, we have this presentation today, is also we would like to involve you. And so, we would like uh, you also to help us with field data collection. Uh, so uh, students from us can go to the fields, alumni from us can help in, in sharing data, and we believe that that will be a positive contribution to the accuracy uh, of our system. Now, the last part of my presentation is more related to some uh, applications, an example of this remote sensing. The, this first slide is from Ton Le Sap, eh, which is a very big wetland eh, in Cambodia. And here uh, we just show you an example of how uh, data on uh, evapotranspiration mapping on, based on remote sensing uh, is used to calculate how much green and blue water consumption we have. So this first picture is on the dry season. Eh, so there is uh, five months with a very low rainfall. Um, and during this period, the main uh, land use depends on, on, uh, on blue water. So if you look at the blue water picture, uh, you can see that it is substantial, whereas the green water is, is very little. Now, if we move then to the opposite, so if we go to the next one in the uh, period of high rainfall, and then, then we see that the blue water is very limited because all the water you need is is provided by rainfall. So now we, we use this kind of data from images to create the sheets. And many of the sheets that we produce have a monthly interval. So you can really check month by month what's going on. We think that is a good uh, say temporal resolution. Weekly is too much. You get too much data. Um, daily is absolutely, you need a different type of model, like a decision support model. 
um, water accounting is meant for longer term planning. And monthly data then is fine. It, it, you can show differences in storage and differences in water volumes and like in this example, differences in green and blue water. This is an example eh, of uh, land use eh, from uh, remote sensing mapping. Um, this is the Mara Basin in Kenya and here we have combined Landsat information at 30 meter pixels, so every pixel is 30 meter by 30 meter. Um, with field information, so our alumni have helped to, to validate this map. And then you can make detailed analysis. Huh? So you can really see which area is covered by corn or, or which area uh, is uh, under uh, grass huh? or other types of land use. Huh? And yeah, again, if we have a proper land use information, we can also know much better on how the water is used. Now, these days, water productivity ranks very high on the agenda. And people all say, look, if we have a water crisis, we have to improve water productivity. And that is indeed a very logical choice because it is defined as the, the production per unit of water. So, uh, don't confuse it with efficiency, as I showed in the previous slides. Efficiency is, is much more a fraction of which percent of water is arriving at a certain destination. Production is much more like how much crop biomass or crop yield do I get, or how much dollars do I gain, or how many jobs I get per unit of water. Uh, so it is very much used until now in, in, in the field of agriculture and I guess in the future also we will expand this more into the field of ecosystem services. So people speak about it but what I always like to see is an example okay and this is an example of a study we did with FAO on Morocco. So the, the pixel size here is 250 meter it's perhaps a little bit coarse but then you can cover an entire country. So on this picture you can see for wheat that there are many farmers that um, reach 2 kilogram of wheat or even 2.5 kilogram of wheat per cubic meter of water. These kind of maps can be computed now from satellite data. We don't need to go to the field and measure flows uh, because we define it per unit of water consumed and the unit per water consumed is expressed into evapotranspiration, which is one of our data sets. So, it shows you where farmers are doing very well, or actually systems, because you look at country scale, and you can look at systems in other provinces uh, where the productivity is lower. On the next slide, it's the same concept, but now we zoom in. Uh, so in, you have a little bit this Google Earth effect that you can zoom in uh, into the crop, and then you can see almost individual fields. This is based on a 30 meter. It was a study we are currently doing for Asian Development Bank. Um, Asian Development Bank has embraced water accounting and they would like to test it uh, in more than six countries in Asia as, as, a, as a pilot study to, to find out um, what the response is from governments uh, and, and how to d detect how you can guide governments on making better policies. Now, for instance, Vietnam wants to have much higher water productivities and this is an analysis uh, of a typically an area of 10 by 10 kilometer, uh, let's say at irrigation scheme level, where at the left hand picture we can see the productivity of rice. So we can see farmers with two ton per hectare, but if you go 500 meter further, you can, you can find farmers with seven ton per hectare. Uh, so you see enormous differences uh, in short distance. Not always very clear if you're in the field. And the right-hand picture, we can see how much water they need or consume to reach that production. So you can really see huge differences, which means there's also a lot of opportunity to locally improve water productivity. So we summarize these water use things in agricultural sheets. So this is an example that you can also review from our website. And this one is very much hydrologically related. We cannot have uh, flow stations everywhere. And this picture of the Mara shows you an example how we use uh, remote sensing information, rainfall and ET, to estimate river flow. Uh, so 
the automatically the location of streams are detected using an elevation model and then we accumulate the total runoff so that everywhere in uh, actually every 250 meter transect in, in a river we can estimate the monthly flows uh, and that is very attractive for the planning the water levels are important and uh, countries do not share it easily but we want to know how much water is in rivers or is in are in, 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 re in reservoirs uh, and we have a satellite based altimeters that can measure these levels and finally we sh i show you here a picture on how we can compute water withdrawals this is an example from Incomati basin there's a lot of irrigated agriculture so when we combine the layers of irrigated land uh, together with data on uh, ET and green ET and ET from blue water resources, we can make maps of withdrawals. So we can now really look into an individual polygon and check how much water they are pumping and even yeah, check that whether that is authorized or not by comparing it to water rights records. Right? So this kind of spatial data is, is, is kind of the basic input. We summarize that again in, in, in a sheet where, where we say how much water is abstracted. So to conclude, uh, I'm going towards the end of my presentation. Um, yeah, the water accounting is something uh, that we have been developing over the last three years. And we do that as a partnership. Uh, we do that with IMI, the International Water Management Institute in, in Lao, in, uh, with, in Vietnam in uh, Vientiane with FAO, with the Land and Water Division, and also with uh, UNESCO WAP, the World Water Assessment Program. So we have a partnership where we do this together. And this is a little bit where we are at the moment. So it started from uh, 96, 97 uh, by David Moldin. And at the same time, we have started to work on the sciences needed to create the spatial data sets. Um, since 2013, we are really actively taking this up. We do several pilot studies with ADB uh, since 2014. Uh, we do a lot of capacity building, and, and Elga is really one of our uh, captains here, uh, providing training to many countries on how to do this. And then gradually, we hope that more and more ministries will create their own, um, let's say, uh, center for water accounting and we know that in India and in Egypt they have already decided to go for that and once you have these centers in place yeah then also you can get success and uh, you can only get good results if such a system um, is in place so this picture shows you countries in green and basins uh, in orange where we do this pilot studies so you can see that at this moment, we are dominantly present in Asia and in Africa. Uh, it is very likely that also some studies with the World Bank will start soon in the Americas. And so we really would like to start rolling out this system. Now, everything we make is open access. Our tools can be used and you can download them. So um, there is this github.com and that is the common place for uh, software now these days. And we have a uh, GitHub account for water accounting. So all our Python scripts can be downloaded. So researchers can uh, do it. Also, people that we provide training, they will use the tool so that in the end we get one standard uh, data set for the world. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we have a website. If you want to have more information, please visit wateraccounting.org. We also have uh, every summer an, uh, a course, a summer course of one week uh, that is meant for basically our internal students, but um, there is also some seats available for, for outsiders uh, that really would like to more, learn more about this. And hopefully in uh, 2018, we can also start a one year master course uh, in water accounting. So with this, I hope I have given you a first glimpse of, uh, of what we do. And I think now, um, Elga, we should move maybe to more general questions yes. and, and answers. Yeah. So now it's the time. If you're interested and you want to ask any question to Professor Wim Basianten, uh, you can send your question via email at alumni um, at unescoic.org. 
we already have received one question, the first question from uh, Oliver from Rwanda, and he's asking about groundwater. Uh -huh. So he wants to know how uh, Water Accounting Plus takes into account groundwater boundaries, uh, which might be sometimes uh, different from conventional hydrological boundaries mm -hmm. of the river bed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, thank you very much uh, for this question. Um, Indeed, an aquifer is uh, behaving independently from a river basin. Um, so we um, use also uh, global um, groundwater models for, for this purpose. Um, we are not doing that ourselves. That will be uh, way too much work. But we have a very close um, interaction um, with the University of Utrecht, who made an kind of a global uh, mud flow model based on all kind of, I would say, best possible data on the boundaries of aquifers that are currently available. That also includes data from IGRAC, uh, and they have uh, enriched these data sets further. So, um, yeah, we, we, we know and we realize that aquifers may have different boundaries, and we use different sources to describe these boundaries. Okay. Um... Since we are still waiting for some more questions, then perhaps I can also ask some. I prepared a few uh -huh. uh, to, I think, to facilitate the discussion uh, on the topic. And let's say that um, I'm working for government and um, I want to find ways to reduce water scarcity uh -huh. or I want to increase water supply. Yeah, yeah. And how, in practice, this yeah. water accounting uh, partnership and framework can help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, that's a good question. So, yeah, as I mentioned in the beginning, water scarcity is getting worse and worse. So, um, yeah, what we should not do, in my view, is just make a basin green or red. And that is too simple. Um, there's no need to do that. That you do if you have no data. But we have now all the data. We have data at every 250 meter. We have the data for every land use class and month by month. So, we can really look much better in but where is the problem? Is it in the irrigation or is it in the wetlands or is it in the forest or is it in the urban areas and, and during which, which periods? And so first I think you have to better understand the magnitude of the problem and, and where in the basin it does occur. And yeah, I think here I like that we have spatial data. Huh? So we can, we can see it. It's not a guess, but we can use the images to find out where is it occurring. Now, and then the second step is that we, uh, we work on a number of solutions. So solutions can be, uh, yeah, can be manifold. There is not a standard solution. Huh? We, we, we have different kind of solutions uh, in terms of maybe we can reduce the water demand. Huh? For instance, um, uh, there are uh, options to reduce the growing season of a certain crop. Huh? Or, um, yeah, you can do something else to, to reduce the, the demand of water. So, because water scarcity is usually the difference between the demand and the amount of water that is supplied. So, reducing demand is one thing. The other thing is to increase the supply. Now, the very common uh, approach uh, that is widely applied in monsoonal systems is to have more storage. Now, storage can be through high dams, but it can also be very local. Sometimes local solutions can be very efficient, especially at village level. At the community level, you would like to have local solutions. Now, one thing is to make small, small uh, catchment uh, facilities, like, like small water harvesting uh, facilities. But also, um, you can stimulate the recharge. Huh? So, if you can have more local recharge of groundwater, uh, then it will also help to, um, to, to uh, make water available uh, during, during the dry season. Huh? Again, a monsoonal system will have too much water in the wet season, but will have a shortage of water in the dry season. Huh? So, and then the water accounting, actually, we can make in a way that you can check this alternative solutions. Right? So you can say, now, what about if we do this, or what about we, if we do that? And then you can check how your account will change. Right? And if the account will change favorably, then you know that you have found a good solution. Right? So the accounting can also be used to appraise alternative solutions um, to overcome water scarcity. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have received a second question now from uh, um, alumni from Nigeria. And um, this person is saying that during the presentation you've been talking about Python. Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned Python as the computer language of the future. Yes. Yeah? And I think they want to get a little more information and also some highlights. Uh, w w why is it so? Okay. Well, what I what I observe is that um, there is now a trend moving or going on from, let's say, commercial packages, commercial software packages on GS and remote sensing to more free uh, freeware, so that many more people can start using it. And what you see is that all these packages have one common language, uh, which which is Python, uh, and also it gives you a lot of flexibility. It's easy to 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 learn and to apply. Uh, um, I, I would say it's almost like an, a new MATLAB. Huh? You, you have many functions. It's um, you can do great things. So even with a few few less a few days huh, of lessons, you can do a quick analysis, and it's fun. Huh? It's fun that you know you you have your own question, you have your own concern that you want to analyze, and maybe the standard things will not provide that, and then. You make your own Python, and then suddenly, you, wow! Now I have even a map, and I, I know where I can uh, where I can find the solution. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have no more time. I think. No more time for question. Unfortunately, we received a few more, but uh, it's not possible because we have to close in a couple of minutes. I want to thank you all for participating to this online seminar, and I would like to remind you that the second. Alumni online seminar will be the 23rd of May at the same time. And uh, will be so the topic of the presentation will be expanding, expanding the Panama Canal. And it will be given by a um, future alumni yes. of, uh, of UNESCO IG. He will graduate soon in April, in, in April 2017. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Professor Wimbas Janssen. It was a great uh, presentation. And it was my pleasure. Time. And uh, thank you really for giving me the opportunity to explain the work that we do uh, for the whole world. So um, if you have, yeah, visit our website. You can always uh, send an email message. Um, we are really with a team now, you with solving the water accounts. So thank you very much for your attention.